This is the Gigabyte Aero 15. It's a 15 inch Nvidia RTX studio laptop rocking a 15.6 inch Samsung AMOLED display, decent hardware all packaged up in a nice solid aluminium chassis. Now big thanks to scan.co.uk and Nvidia for making this video possible by getting this laptop out to me. But this is not a sponsored video, I'm not being paid for this one, so I'm free to say whatever I like. But, I can say but, that this is actually the entry level KD model that currently costs around £1,900. It's available from scan.co.uk and of course there is a link down in the description below. So first up, let's talk specs. As an Nvidia Studio laptop, you know it's going to be packing some decent hardware. There's sort of a minimum requirement you have to meet in order to be labelled as an Nvidia Studio laptop. So let's find out what's inside this one. For starters, we've got a 105 watt Nvidia RTX 3060 laptop GPU, and that's combined with Intel's 11th gen Core i7-11800H. There's also 16 gigabytes of DDR4 32 megahertz RAM, a one terabyte SSD, a massive 99 watt hour battery, which is combined with a really chunky 230 watt power supply. And then of course, there's also Bluetooth and Wi-Fi 6 to make sure you've got nice, fast wireless connections. That 16 gigabytes of RAM, however, I think is a little on the low side, especially for the price point. 16 gigabytes of RAM is plenty for gaming, but on the video creation, the video editing sides of things, it's definitely on the lower side. Fortunately, it is replaceable and upgradable. There are two slots, so you can fit up to 64 gigabytes of RAM if you so wish. The SSD, however, is solid. I'm getting read speeds of 5,000 megabytes a second and write speeds of 2,400. And there's actually a second empty SSD bay on the motherboard, so you can drop in another SSD if you so wish, giving you up to two terabytes of storage. Now the design is kind of different, it leans much more into the gamer aesthetic rather than the professional sort of creator side of things, but I quite like it, it's not too shouty, it just has a little bit of personality. It's a completely matte black finish which does look good but is a bit of a fingerprint magnet and is prone to scratches. On the front of the lid near the bottom we've got this faux carbon fibre effect which does look kind of cool and then there's this aero logo which lights up when the laptop is turned on. The only other little bit of flair is this nice little chrome aero logo around the back on the rear vent. Now it is an aluminium build all around so it feels nice and strong, durable, there's not really any flex going on so you don't need to worry too much about that. There is however unfortunately quite a bit of screen wobble so if that annoys you, you just need to bear that in mind. We've got vents on the sides, rear and bottom of the laptop to aid cooling so it does do a decent job of keeping the laptop cool but it can get a little bit noisy. When gaming, they ran in the region of 50 to 54 decibels when the laptop was set to its gaming mode. That was pretty consistent. You can force the fans to run at sort of full turbo speed just using the function key and the escape key. That of course helps to keep the laptop cool, but it does increase the noise running more in the region of about 60 decibels. We've got two two watt downwards facing speakers at the front. They're okay at best, they're not particularly great to be honest. They don't get particularly loud and they lack any sort of real meaningful bass, but they will get you by in a pitch. Size wise, it's pretty average for a laptop of this type. It's relatively thin at just two centimeters at its thickest, and it weighs in at 2.3 kilos or just over five pounds. Open it up, which you can do so with one hand, which is always a bonus. You'll notice the really thin three millimeter bezels around the top and the sides of the screen. These also have got little rubber bumpers on them to help protect the screen, and it also gives it a nice soft close. The bottom bezel, however, is pretty thick. This laptop does have a bit of a chin. Then of course there's the 15.6 inch Ultra HD 60Hz 16x9 Samsung AMOLED gloss display. It covers 100% of the DCI-P3 colour gamut, it's VESA display HDR True Black 400 certified and it's both Pantone validated and X-Rite colour calibrated right out of the factory. And it's a really nice display right out of the box. Colour accuracy is good, it's bright enough for most uses even if it's not necessarily the brightest display in the world and saturation and contrast as you'd expect from an AMOLED display are also really really top notch. 
Personally, my only real gripe with the display is that aspect ratio. At 16 by 9, it does feel a little bit squashed. I'm much more of a fan of the 16 by 10 aspect ratio, especially on a content creator laptop. It doesn't seem like much, but just having that additional 10% vertical space really does make a world of difference. The fact that this laptop has the big chin at the bottom, it does look like you could get away with squeezing in a 16 by 10 aspect ratio screen without really changing the footprint of the whole laptop all that much. So that's definitely something I'd like to see on a future iteration. Directly underneath the chin, we have this really awkwardly placed and honestly not very good webcam. It does have a privacy shield, which is always good. And honestly, every laptop should come with a privacy shield if it has a webcam, in my opinion. But it's just a pretty low quality 720p webcam at a really weird angle, honestly. So I'm at my standing desk, exactly the same lighting as I shot the rest of the video on. And as you can see, it's a really weird angle. I'm stood exactly where I'd be to actually use the keyboard and use the laptop in a normal manner, and it's cut me off. I'd have to step back a bit and really stretch to try and use the keyboard. Underneath that, we do have the full-size RGB backlit illuminated keyboard. And there is some proper RGB gamer goodness to be had here. When you first turn it on, it's got this crazy rainbow effect, which admittedly does look really, really cool, but it is kind of distracting, especially if you're trying to get some work done, you're trying to do any sort of content creation. Fortunately, it's really easy to adjust it using the control panel software that comes with the laptop, or you can turn it off just using the FN, the function key, and the spacebar at any time. Now, one cool thing, even with the illumination turned off, if you hold the FN key, it lights up all of the function keys. You can actually see what you're about to hit, which is quite a nice, handy little feature. So what's it like to type on? Well, it's actually quite nice. There's very little flex due to that aluminum chassis, so you don't get any movement while you're typing. There's a decent amount of travel and the keys are relatively spaced out. If I'm being picky, I think the keys are just a tiny bit mushy for my liking, but overall, it's not too bad. Of course, they have tried to cram in a full size keyboard. Now, the only problem with that is it does shift everything over to the left. If you're typing on a desk or whatever, it's not too much of an issue because you just adjust yourself or you just the laptop accordingly. But if you're sat with it on your lap, it does feel like you're your hands are over to the left hand side a little bit more than I would like. And then continuing down the laptop, we've got a relatively small but really quite nice Windows Precision trackpad with multi-touch. It actually has a really nice click to it, so it is quite nice to use. On that, there is the integrated fingerprint reader, which works really well with Windows Hello, and has logged me in consistently and quickly every single time. And on the sides, of course, we've got our IO, and Gigabyte have done a really cracking job here. There's a really good, nice selection of ports. On the left-hand side, we've got our full-size HDMI 2.1 port, a mini display port 1.4, a USB 3.2 port, a combo headphone and mic jack, and a full-size RJ45 Ethernet port. You don't see Ethernet ports on laptops of this size very often, so that's really great to see. Flip it over and on the right hand side, working back to front, we've got our DC power jack, a full size UHS 2 card reader. Again, full size card readers should be on any creator laptop, in my opinion. There's really no excuse. The fact that it's UHS 2 is an absolute bonus. Then we've got a full Thunderbolt 4 port, which means crazy fast SSD speeds, and you can edit with your files on your SSDs. Again, winner there. And then lastly, we've got two more USB 3.2 ports. If I was being really picky, maybe I'd like to see one more Type-C port on there. It doesn't need to be Thunderbolt, but just another Type-C port, just for any additional accessories and that sort of thing. But overall, it's a really fantastic selection of ports, so I'm happy with that. You could leave the house without many dongles at all. You're pretty much good to go. So what about performance? Well, as mentioned, it is an NVIDIA RTX Studio laptop, and this falls under their creative maestro category, which basically means that it should be good for editing 6K footage in real time and gaming for up to 1440p resolutions. So let's find out. For those interested in gaming, I ran two of my standard gaming benchmarks. Pretty much everything was run at the 1440p resolution because that's pretty much the best resolution for this machine, in my opinion. The difference between 1440p and 4K at this size is pretty indistinguishable and you just lose so many frames going to 4K. So 1440p is absolutely the sweet spot. So first up, Shadow of the Tomb Raider. We ran the benchmark, 1440p, high settings with no ray tracing, and we got well over 60 frames per second. We then ran the same 1440p high settings, but this time we used the medium ray tracing preset and we still managed a solid 68 frames per second. 
Next up, there was Forza Horizon. Same resolution, 1440p, using the high preset, which obviously has the ray tracing set to medium, and we got a solid 90 frames per second. We then did the same, 1440p, this time with the ultra preset, which does put ray tracing on high, and we managed an average of 65 frames per second. I jumped into some Destiny 2 to see how that works as well. Of course, that doesn't have a benchmark, but 1440p, once again, high preset, it was really, really playable, absolutely locked 60 frames per second. But what about video editing? Well, I'm gonna open up my favorite DaVinci Resolve. This is the paid studio version. We're gonna have a little play and see what it can do and just have a general idea of how well it performs. Now, everything's being captured externally on an external capture card, so that won't be affecting the performance whatsoever. Let's boot it up and have a look. So here we are on the laptop. Now I'm gonna use the Gigabyte Control Center to make sure I'm in creator mode. This just controls the CPU, GPU overclock to optimize performance. And then we're gonna jump into DaVinci Resolve. Now while that's loading, the first project we're gonna look at is actually stored on my Samsung T5 SSD. All the files are on there, so let's see how this performs when it's plugged in via the Thunderbolt 4. And if we hit play, we can play back at our full 25 frames per second. We can skip around, it doesn't seem to be skipping a beat. That looks pretty happy. A few drop frames there, but then it's caught up with itself. And we'll come over here, hit play, and that's all looking pretty good. There's a few titles in here, so let's just see how this plays. I doubt it's going to play back in real time first time around, but let's have a look. That is dropping frames. We've got another one just over here, so we'll try this one. And that dropped a few frames, but overall didn't do too bad. So playing Ultra HD 422 10 bit footage on an Ultra HD timeline doesn't seem to be giving it too much trouble at all. Full real time playback without any problems. We've got color grading on here and the titles are working. Yes, there's a few skipped frames, but overall not too bad. Now, if it was me, what I would do, I'd drop this down to half resolution when I was actually working on it. It just makes sense to have it as half resolution. You don't need it to be the Ultra HD at the time being. And that's gonna pretty much knock everything into place and we will get pretty much real-time playback even when using these fusion titles now this project is a little over 19 minutes in length it's all that ultra hd footage so i exported this off using the nvidia encoder which means it's using that rtx 3060 to actually encode the footage and it delivered the video in just eight minutes and 31 seconds which is a really solid export time for this 19 minute ultra HD project. So that's pretty good going. Now Nvidia say that it's good for 6K footage, so let's try some of that as well and see how that performs. Now before we actually do that, I've got this B-RAW 6K samples folder. We're gonna copy that. That's located on my Samsung T5. We're gonna drop this on the desktop and we'll see how quickly this transfers as well. And that's 40 gig total of video files. And it says it's gonna take about one minute, 15 seconds, because it's transferring it just shy of 500 megabytes per second. So this timeline here, 4096 by 2160, it's a full 4K resolution timeline. All of these files are actually 6K Blackmagic RAW, but they're anamorphic, so I've had to de-squeeze them. We're just gonna drop them straight on the timeline, just to show you we are running at the full resolution, and all of this can be played back in real time. We've got 24 frames, we're not dropping anything at all. I can click around and everything is working exactly as expected. So Nvidia were right to market this as being able to play back 6K footage in real time without any real issues. So that's thumbs up, it's looking pretty good so far. So we're gonna to go to our motion effects, temporal noise reduction. Let's just try two frames for starters and we'll make this look slightly more realistic. Something I'd actually use, lower that down and we'll hit play and we are dropping a few frames. We're only getting 20 to 21-ish frames per second. If we just put it to five, let's see what we get. Dropping a bit there, 13, 15 frames per second. So when dropping to half resolution, we can hit play, and we are now getting our full real-time playback. So we're getting 24 frames per second. That's with five frames of temporal noise reduction on. If we reduce that to two, obviously we'll still get real-time, because that's actually slightly easier for this to load, and we're good to go. If you work backwards from that, 4K or Ultra HD, you're not gonna have any real issues using some tempo or noise reduction. If you do, you can easily negate that just by dropping to half resolution on your timeline to get that full real-time playback back if it does struggle. But overall, pretty solid. Let's just try a couple of things to finish off. So we're gonna try this clip here of this guy here, and we're gonna try a magic mask. So we're just gonna open up the magic masks, we'll grab a little pen, we'll put a marker on, and we're just gonna draw over him so that it gets highlighted and we'll just give it a second to have a think. Now, in a moment or two, he should sort of turn red to show that he's been highlighted. 
like so. Now if we hit play, we can track that forwards. It's quite a messy background, you'd have to refine this mask a little bit, but this is just to see how it does. It's playing that back actually quicker than I was expecting it to, considering the resolution and the footage that we're using. It's not quite real time, but it's not too bad at all. Now for our last test, we're just gonna come into this clip once again. We're gonna drop the face refinement on there. We'll just analyze this and see how it does. And after a second or two, it's picked up this person's face. It's mapped out the jaw, the mouth, the nose, the eyes, the eyebrows. It's doing everything pretty good. That's 10%. And then we can use all of the face refinement tools to add any color to a face, reduce any shadows, do all that sort of cool stuff. So this actually is a really solid choice for video editing in DaVinci Resolve. If you're doing loads and loads of color grading, massive long project, you are probably gonna hit the limit with that 16 gigabytes of RAM. But if you're a YouTube creator, you're doing much shorter 10, 15 minute videos, for example, then you're not gonna have too many issues whatsoever. If you're a fusion expert, again, you're probably gonna want something with more video RAM and more RAM. But if you're a general user like I am, it's actually a really, really solid choice for anything that you want to do in DaVinci Resolve. So there you go. That is the Gigabyte Aero 15. What do you think? Let me know down in the comments below. Thank you for watching. Take it easy and I'll see you next time.